All right. We are going to uh, finish up this lecture today. It should be pretty short, so that should give you enough time to kind of prepare for your exam, which is Monday, right? So running out of time there. If you've not started preparing for that exam, you're a little behind now. You need to be, be preparing for it. Remember, you've got a quiz is. It's actually open through next Friday. The highest grade you make on that is your uh, is what goes in the test. So that's kind of where it is. But that's there to prepare you for the star test more than this one. And you've got a study guide. The test will look just like the tests have always looked. So you'll still have to have a system where you're going to have to pick some of the words. And uh, I'll give you two or three essays, and you'll have to pick a couple of them. Uh, so it should be real familiar to you on the test. I will be available to help if anybody gets stuck on anything. You can feel free to email me or text me or you know call me, whatever you need to do. I know some of you have called me before with questions. Uh, feel free to do that. I, I will be glad to make sure you have the right information. Um, all right, back to our discussion. We are talking about kind of the age of industrialization and how things, how things shifted at this time period. When we left off, we were talking about these new systems of uh, organizing businesses into either trusts or a term that we're going to introduce here shortly, monopoly, uh, where, where businesses cooperate in order to set prices. You can see how effective it was. During this time period, iron and steel production, particularly under U.S. steel, became a trust. And you can see how, uh, how efficient and effective a business model it was as the production of iron and steel was exploding. You can imagine that if you're Andrew Carnegie, if you're, the per if you're one of these guys uh, that, that's made their fortune off of, off of the steel industry, you are making a great deal of money. I'm going to skip this one. Uh, I, I, just, I put it in here for you so you can see there are all kinds of new business models. I'm not going to go into all of them. But it talks about the oil model and the railroad model and the steel model, all of these different different ideas. So you can kind of see how things work. I don't think we need to go over it. Uh, it it's pretty clear. Corporations were merging and through something we call interlocking directorates. So let's say you're a steel company and I'm a steel company and we want to be able to create a trust to set prices. What we can do is you could put me on your board as a board of member of the board of directors and I could put you on my board as a member of the board of directors and we would have a voting right in order to keep prices uh, artificially high so there's no competition there to drive price down. That's what trust did. This was a way to get around the anti-monopoly laws. Instead of creating one company we would merge our directorates. Now, today that would be illegal, but it was something that, that occurred quite a bit in that time period. And you can see that around the turn of the century is when it's going to hit its height, okay? Uh, massive spike in mergers as you had companies taking over each other and, and, and merging their directorates. You had U.S. Steel swallowing up all the smaller steel companies. You had Standard Oil swallowing up all of the smaller oil companies. Uh, Cornelius Vanderbilt and his railroads went through and started buying up all the railroads. And you ended up with these guys that we call robber barons, or the more positive term is captains of industry. These people that managed to dominate an entire economic system. And they managed to do that by um, being able to control and set prices. There is a brand new type of businessman, the financier, and the person that is most famous for this is J.P. Morgan, J. Pierpont Morgan. You may have heard of Morgan Stanley Banking, or uh, you've heard, I'm sure you've heard the name J.P. Morgan before. He was a, an incredibly wealthy man, but he made his money as a broker. The first modern corporations start to develop at this time period, where they start selling off shares in corporations. Now this is this is pretty elementary uh, understanding of what a share is, but I've discovered over the years that a lot of students don't really understand how corporations work. What they do is they sell you a stock certificate. That's what that picture is, as a piece of preferred stock. That stock certificate 
is actually ownership in a share of the company. So if they, if we're just going to say if there are 100 shares out there and you own 10 of them, you would own 10% of that company. And that meant that your votes, you would have 10% of the votes in how the company ran. Now, obviously companies have more than 100 shares. Uh, and if you can buy, if you can purchase enough stock, then you're purchasing enough ownership that you can kind of control a company. Well, that's what, what uh, Jay Pierpont Morgan does, is he brokers these deals, and he acts as a holding company for, for stocks. And he ends up becoming very, very wealthy by uh, purchasing large amounts of stocks, oftentimes secretly, and doing takeovers of companies. How does this work? Well, let's say there's a company that I want, and I think it's undervalued. If I'm J. Pierpont Morgan, I will go buy a large amount of shares, but not enough that I threaten the, the current owners. And then I would get maybe my kids or other people that work for me to go buy shares and then agree to sell those shares to me. What I've just done is made a hostile takeover of a company. I've gone through and taken over a company one share at a time. This is one of the, this is one of the, the new things that happen. And J.P. Morgan is kind of the founder of this idea. Uh, it's a new idea that you can make money not by producing something, but simply by trading, buying and selling. J.P. Morgan did not produce anything. He made nothing. All he did was buy shares low, sell shares high, and flip companies. Okay? Uh, this is something that a lot of modern brokers do. Okay? A new idea. How effective was it? Well, just look at Wall Street. Wall Street is the center of stock market trade in our country. Uh, it has been since the 1700s. By the way, it's called Wall Street. I talked about this in the last last semester. But it's called Wall Street because when New York was, was, was New Amsterdam, that was where the wall was that kept the Indians out. Okay? Well, Wall Street's there. And in 1867, this is what Wall Street looked like. It's still a pretty, pretty nice place. But look at the difference. By 1900, Wall Street looks like a palace. It looks like the stock exchange looks like a uh, uh, like a Greek Greco-Roman temple. It's because the amount of money that is coming in there has changed dramatically. That's the way the world is changing between the Civil War and say 1900. Okay, everything is changing dramatically. Here's this guy, Frederick Taylor. Frederick Taylor came up with the idea of what we call scientific management. He, uh, he's the pioneer in this. Now, the Japanese are going to take this idea in the 1940s and 50s and run with it and create massive companies like Toyota out of it. But it starts here in the United States with this guy. And what Frederick Taylor did is he said, we should measure every aspect of the production of something and then we should cut out as much waste as we can. So he would scientifically sit there and watch while you're doing a job with a stopwatch and figure out what the average time was that it took to do something and where the waste was. And he would come through on assembly lines and figure out exactly how fast should the assembly line move. And if there was wasted space uh, between you know, say between you and the person next to you, he would shrink that spot. He would go into factories and go, you know, part of the problem is this factory is too large and things are moving too far. If we shrunk the factory by a little bit, move the walls in a little bit, uh, th things would move quicker. A lot of this stuff seems silly, but he would save a second here and a second there and eventually end up uh, being able to save a great deal of time and a great deal of money for his businesses. Um, this is something that, that, that goes on over and over and over again. There was a guy a few years later in the 1920s named, uh, named uh, oh, my brain is just shut off. I can't think of his name, Lear, the guy that came up with, with the Lear jet eventually, who once, once said that uh, through scientific management that he would trade his mother-in-law for a pound. Uh, he was trying to get, get rid of one pound of, of, of weight on a, on a plane. Well, that's scientific management, okay? 
this kind of thing happens. In 1911, he came up with this idea, and he starts reorganizing everything. He takes Henry Ford's assembly line that we saw before and made it ten times more efficient. Well, we didn't just reorganize the assembly line. This became the standard of how we did everything. Uh, standard oil went down and figured out exactly how many, you know, when they would seal an oil can, exactly how many drops of oil it would take and where it would take, because or, 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 or how many drops of, of, of welding it would take to seal that, that metal tin. Because if it took, you know, if you, if you put one, one extra drop and you're doing a million of these, you're wasting a lot of money, okay? Uh, kitchens and homes were redesigned through scientific management to, to flow easier so, so you would have more time, uh, time to spend with your family. Uh, cars were redesigned where, thing, where uh, things were placed where it was more convenient to the driver. Uh, everything. Schools were redesigned under scientific management plans. In fact, there was a period in this time period where students no longer changed classes. Instead, the students stayed in one spot and the teachers would change classes as well because it was faster to move one person than it was to move uh, a whole group. It was a way of keeping things more scientific. All right? The effect of this was more billionaires in a lot different areas. Billion, billionaires in 1900, and I know that's kind of hard to see. I even have a hard time seeing it, and I'm standing right here. In 1900, most of our billionaires made their money in the railroads. Railroads were the engine that drove our economy. By 1920, that's going to be different. It's going to be automobiles. But in 1900, railroads are the engine that drive our economy. And that's changing a little bit. You see uh, some, some things up there that are going to be missing in the next one. By 1918, at the end of this period, most of our billionaires have made their money in finance. That's what that big black area is, is finance. That's not even on the, the chart in 1900. Nobody made their money by buying and selling stocks in 1900, but by 1918, this is the largest percentage of billionaires. It's been a major shift in how people in the United States even think, okay? I love this cartoon. Uh, it's been on the STAR test before. It's been on the AP test a lot. Uh, it's called the Protectors of Our Industries. I don't know if you can tell or not, but those guys at the top, those are the robber barons. Those are the captains of industry, uh, the Cornelius Vanderbilts and the Nelson Rockefellers and, and, and those guys. And they're up there getting fat and lazy, while down below it, the whole ship of, 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 of the economy is being held up by, by workers. And what the, they're trying to say here is, uh, the industry is being, being built on the back of our workers. And that was something that was, that was genuinely believed at this time period. This is also a great uh, picture. Tyler, you'll, you'll respect this picture uh, uh, from your own background. This picture is called the Bosses of the Senate. And it's kind of hard for you all to tell, I imagine. But the senators are the little people up front sitting in the chairs. And behind it, those big fat men you look at it, it says things like steel trust. Uh, I, can't, I can't read them all from here. But, uh, copper trust, steel trust, all these different trusts. And what they're saying here is that while the Senate, microphone's right here in front of you guys. You gotta be quiet. What they're saying here is that while the senators are the power and they're the ones casting the votes, they're really being controlled by the big money interest. The big money is who is paying to get them elected, who's paying to get them re-elected, uh, who's fi fi financing their, their lavish lifestyle, because honestly, congressmen don't get paid that much. So who are the real bosses here? Well, at this time period, without a doubt, the people running the country were the robber barons and the captains of industry, okay? Again, I like the term captains of industry better because to me, they were a positive to the economy. They created jobs, they were good for the economy. A lot of people think of them as robber barons, as something very bad for the economy. Uh, here's a cartoon of the robber baron side. That's a term that was borrowed, 
Back in Europe in the Middle Ages, there were these people that would build toll roads. They were called robber barons. And they would wait at the toll road. And if you needed to get anywhere, you would have to pay to use the road. Uh, well, that's kind of what the term that they were used for these guys. As if you want to, if you want to use the economy, you got to pay the robber barons. So you see, the people are are throwing down their tribute while these rich people are, uh, you know, just sucking it up. Well, that's kind of an unrealistic idea. Those people may be happy to pay pay a lot of money to these, but they wouldn't have jobs at all without. Them. Okay, so say what you want about it. The top left version is the original version of the robber baron cartoon, and the bottom one is the modern version. So you, can, uh, I hope you can see that well on your uh, on your computer or on your printout. All right, so here is probably the dirtiest of the uh, robber barons, Cornelius Vanderbilt, who liked to refer to himself as Commodore Vanderbilt. A Commodore is a person that runs a fleet of ships. Well, he saw himself as running a fleet of trains. And he's the guy that, that gathered all the trains, all the local trains, and, and united them together and connected the trains. And he owned all of the big train companies. Y'all have all played Monopoly before, right? When you play Monopoly, you know, there's the Short Line Railroad and the Pacific Railroad and all these. Those were all of Cornelius Vanderbilt's uh, railroad companies. And when you owned them all, you could charge more money because you had a monopoly. Well, that's what he did. He owned all of them. Uh, now, not literally all. There were some independent railroads, but he owned enough of them that Cornelius Vanderbilt could charge whatever he wanted. Uh, he was busted for violating several interstate commerce laws because uh, uh, he was operating as a trust. He was operating in violation of free trade because nobody was big enough to, to, to compete with him, that he was price gouging people. And when he was uh, asked about this, he gives this quote, uh, he says, can't I do what I want with my money? What he's saying here is, I invested it, I own the company, can't I, can't, who's the government to tell me what to do? I can charge whatever I want. He doesn't say it's right. He never once says I'm fair, he doesn't pretend to be fair. He knows he's price gouging. He just argues that he has a right to be a bad person and price gouge if he wants to. Um, pretty libertarian point of view there. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't like that. A lot of people wouldn't like that at all. So they kind of they kind of took over uh, and attacking him. He became the boogeyman of the robber barons. Here's some more quotes by him. Uh, when he was told, look, what you're doing is not benefiting the public, he said, the public be damned. He doesn't care. He, his statement is, I'm not here for the public. I shouldn't be here for the public. I'm here for my stockholders. And if my stockholders do well and my company does well, the public will do well anyway. Okay? Uh, what do I care about the law? Hain't I got the power? What he's saying is, I don't care about the law. I have all the money. What are you going to do about it? Well, what they did about it was they busted up his business. Eventually, Cornelius Vanderbilt has to dissolve his business and sell off some shares for violating free, uh, uh, free trade restrictions. But for a while there, he's on top of this. Now, I think he might be able to be called a robber baron legitimately. He seems to abuse his power. Uh, that hasn't been said. I think he had a right to abuse his power. By the way, these are the same laws they tried to, uh, to break up Microsoft with about 15 years ago when they tried to, to say that, uh, that Microsoft was a monopoly. Everybody seemed to be doing well. This was like a golden age of money. Uh, the wealthy were getting very, very wealthy. So wealthy that a, an idea starts to grow called the gospel of wealth. The gospel of wealth is, it's really a hangover remnant of Puritanism. Remember way back last year we talked about the Puritans and I told you they believe in predestination and that everything happens, uh, it, it, everything is preordained, that you have no free will. Well that idea is strong in America. It still is, whether we like to think it or not. It's still strong in America. 
And people with a gospel of wealth would say that wealth is not bad. It is not bad to be wealthy. In fact, they would argue that it's a sign of God's approval for how you lived your life that you're wealthy. The argument goes, God preordains everything. Everything is already written before we're ever born. Therefore, if we are rich, if we are wealthy, God must have chosen to make us wealthy. Therefore, we must be among God's chosen people. It's a logical argument. And it's an argument that a lot of people make. In fact, so much so that it became seen as a Christian duty to accumulate wealth. And the more wealth you had, the better Christian you must have been. Could y'all imagine saying that today? Christian. That explains Joel Austin, right? Uh, the next step is they would say you shouldn't help the poor. These guys would say there's no need to help the poor. If God wanted them helped, he would have helped them. Okay? If they're poor, they're poor for a reason, and it's probably that they're sinful. That's a pretty scary thought when you think about it. Do you think we still think that way? I think we do. I don't want to. I think most of us don't want to think that we think that way. But when you're driving down through the big city and you see the guy on the side of the street with a sign that says, we'll work for food, is your first thought, man, I need to pull over and give him a hamburger? Or is your first thought, probably as con artist or he'd probably just drink it away anyway my first thought is I, I'd give him some money but he'd probably just buy a drink you know that's part of this that's part of this idea that's ingrained in us whether we want it to be there or not okay Russell Conwell is the guy that came up with this idea other ideas we had about wealth Andrew Carnegie Andrew Carnegie was the richest man in the world. We talked about him once before. He's that guy that, that comes over to the United States as, a, as a, uh, uh, an immigrant. His, father, his parents die on the way over. He's dirt poor and ends up becoming the richest man in the world. Well, he wrote a book called The Gospel of Wealth where he said some interesting things. First off, he said... Uh, that the Anglo-Saxon race is superior to all other races. This is part of social Darwinism. If you don't know what Anglo-Saxon is, Anglo-Saxon is the Germanic people that settled in England, the Angles and the Saxons. That's where the name England comes from, is land of Angles, Angle land. Okay? Saxony is a place in Germany. So it's basically the white races that are superior. This was his argument. And his argument for it was the most powerful countries in the world are all white countries. England, France, Germany, the United States, Russia, they're all white countries at this time. So therefore, they must be a superior race. Well, that's a pretty stupid argument because it's, it's kind of ignoring everything in the East. It's ignoring how powerful China is. It's ignoring how powerful India could be. Uh, it's also ignoring large chunks of history where Genghis Khan ruled half of the uh, half of the world, you know, it's ignoring a lot of things. But it was what he believed. He also said that wealthy in, wealth inequality is necessary and good. He said that we will never be equal and we should not seek to be equal. There will always be people that work hard and acquire a lot and people that don't work hard and acquire nothing, and that is a good thing. Okay? In his opinion, that's a good... Oh, forgot it. Um, in fact, he said that the wealthy should act as trustees for their poorer brethren. Now, that does not mean that they should be giving money to the poor. That means they should be taking care of the country because the poor can't. They should be keeping the business going because the next generation might need this. So... We, the, you know, the wealthy have a responsibility to make sure the economy continues to grow and continues to expand. 
I like these charts because it shows how much things change. This is a chart of the relative share of world manufacturing in different time periods. It starts in 1880 and goes all the way up to 1913. England is in pink, that's Britain. The United States is in blue. So you can see that when it starts, Great Britain, England, was the dominant power. They were the industrial powerhouse. But you can see very quickly that's going to be shut down and the United States is going to emerge as the dominant manufacturing power in the world. And we are going to remain that dominant economic power in the world all the way up to the modern era. Now, I know you've got people, you hear on the news, China is surpassing us. They're not surpassing us. Not right now. Now, do they have a larger share of the market than they ever have before? Absolutely. But the U.S. is still today the dominant economic market in the world. And it dates back to this time period. All right. So kind of to draw a comparison, I put this up here so we can kind of get a feel uh, for how does this relate to us? Because history is not supposed to be, in part of my language, one damn thing after another. History is supposed to be about us learning things and being able to apply it. So are there modern robber barons? This is a picture of Machiadorus, or a megacorp. Uh, a Machiadorus was a big movement in, in the early 2000s, and it's still going on, where a lot of American businesses are moving across the border into Mexico uh, in order to get cheaper labor. Is that essentially the same thing as the old robber barons? Absolutely it is. We are in a second robber baron period right now. In technology, we're in a second robber baron period right now where a few companies are dominating everything. In cryptocurrency, we are in a second robber baron period right now, although that looks to be collapsing very quickly. Uh, we, we, we will see what happens with that. Uh, all right. So that kind of gets us out of, uh, out of this section. Remember, you have a test on Monday. I'll hang around for a few minutes if you have any questions about something. Don't waste your time. Use your time to either work on your quizzes or work on your study guide. Quizzes is due next Friday, but the test is Monday. Okay? So get busy on it, and I will talk to you later. Is the quizzes going to be a great all right, we are going to uh, finish up this lecture today. It should be pretty short, so that should give you enough time to kind of prepare for your exam, which is Monday, right? So running out of time there. If you've not started preparing for that exam, you're a little behind now. You need to be, be preparing for it. Remember, you've got a quiz is. It's actually open through next Friday. The highest grade you make on that is your uh, is what goes in the test. So. That's kind of where it is. But that's there to prepare you for the STAR test more than this one. And you've got a study guide. The test will look just like the tests have always looked. So you'll still have to have a system where you're going to have to pick some of the words. And uh, I'll give you two or three essays, and you'll have to pick a couple of them. Uh, so it should be real familiar to you on the test. I will be available to help. If anybody gets stuck on anything, you can feel free to email me or text me or you know call me, whatever you need to do. I know some of you have called me before with questions. Uh, feel free to do that. I, I will be glad to make sure you have the right information.